Hi, my name is Jesus Rodriguez. This is Tavista Chronicles from Caracas, number six. Um, today we're going to talk about economy. Then uh, we're going to stop a little bit uh, talking about the Chavista spirit, at least the way we perceive it. Then we're going to talk about uh, the Rastrojos Gate. Rastrojos is this uh, paramilitary drug cartel from Colombia. So that have occupy most of the headlines in Venezuela this week at least. And, we, and we're going to end up talking about some international issues. So talking about the economy, first of all, I have to say the inflation is the thing that are, are, is still driving Venezuelans crazy. Prices are going crazy for the last maybe seven, eight months, seven, eight weeks at least. Uh, uh, after the most recent devaluation of the Bolivar. So so that's the thing that drives most of Venezuelan Chavistas or anti-Chavistas uh, crazy lately in Venezuela. And disregarding that in the last two weeks, the dollar has been getting depreciated in front of the, of the Bolivar, um, prices are still uh, moving up, which is, crazy, but we are used to that here in Venezuela. And some economists might explain that, uh, you know, because of, you know, expectations of economic actors, but also uh, some people might uh, explain that because of political, you know, reasons, which if you ask me, uh, the answer might be in the middle of that. And, uh, and because of that, uh, uh, President Maduro has announced a, a new series of subsidies to the Patria system, what we call Cartet de la Patria. So those subsidies have created a lot of expectations among Venezuelans. So uh, a lot of Venezuelans are expecting to receive those subsidies, but the, the implementation of this new round of uh, subsidies to Carnet de la Patria has been kind of bumpy. Some people have been receiving the subsidies. Some pe most people don't. So we still have to see. They were announced a, a few days ago, but uh, a lot of people are expecting to receive um, those bonuses because you know most Venezuelans need that to survive. Disregarding the the the, the club uh, program that are the two most important things uh, for Venezuelans to survive to the U.S. blockade and the economic warfare. So, uh, and, and because of this inflation crisis and because mm, some, uh, those bonuses have not been received by most of Venezuelans yet, uh, this week there was something interesting called uh, in relation, I mean, the, the most Venezuelans uh, start boycotting uh, eggs because the prices of eggs went up a lot. So, uh, so a lot of Venezuelans this week started boycotting eggs, and and that has created some sort of uh, nice incipient movement of boycott that I believe that we need to uh, promote or encourage because at least somehow you might try to put some pressure on retailers and producers in order to, you know, don't go crazy with prices. So I believe that in that sense, uh, not only uh, organized communities and organized groups, but I believe that there should be some interrelation or connection between those groups and the government in order to, you know, promote this kind of initiatives in a most efficient way. So this is the most important things that I want to mention about uh, the economy. Talking uh, about the Chavista spirit, if you ask me, I feel that the Chavista spirit is still ha very high, especially when we talk about confrontation with the U.S. or with any other country that decides to invade us or do some sort of military aggression against Venezuela. So especially this week that we have been, you know, facing the reactivation of uh, the Tiara, which is this treaty within the OAS that was almost dead, but the right-wingers and the U.S. decided to revive. Um, 
So because of that, in recent days, we have been, you know, dealing again in Venezuela with the possibility of being invaded. And that, I mean, that put the Chavista spirit in a high level. And that always happened. That's not something new, but I, I believe that is important to highlight, to let you know that uh, that spirit is still there. But of course, uh, when we talk about the problems, the economic problems, the, the, there's a, a different approach, uh, which is basically, uh, if you ask me, at least the way we see it is that most of the services are tired of the lack of strong hand, not only because of the economic problems and, and, and the way the government uh, address the inflation problems and uh, uh, the wages that are too low, uh, or the way you control the retailers and the producers. So in that sense, uh, uh, there's a lot of discontent, if you ask me, about uh, the way uh, Maduro's government has been handling the, the, the economic situation, but also the political situation. A lot of people are dreaming in having, at some point soon, why they be behind bars because uh, I believe that I already talked a few uh, weeks ago about that, but uh, at this point, I believe that is most costly affected for the country to have him behind bars than to have him free. And when I talk about him, I not talk about only him because Guaido himself do not mean anything uh, in Venezuela about all the organized crime scheme that they have designed with the help of the U.S. taking control of Venezuelan assets all over the world, embassies, diplomatic offices, and, uh, and, 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 and a lot of things like that uh, make him dangerous. So that is why a lot of Chavistas, including me, believe that that it's time to put that guy behind bars. Um, so that's my appreciation on the on the current Chavista spirit. Now I'm going to talk about the Rastrojos Gate. Uh, again, this is a, a, and this thing came to life again because of these photos that uh, this guy Waldo took uh, a few months ago with the the co-leaders of this paramilitary group from Colombia. And, uh, and in recent days, for some reason, that I believe are more connected to Colombian politics, the photos that he took with this leader of Rastrojos uh, uh, gained a lot of tractions within public opinion in Colombia. So that has created a lot of tension inside Colombia. I believe that the impact of all of those photos uh, is more is higher in Colombia than in Venezuela. And, uh, and I believe that it's very important to highlight the, what how these paramilitary groups operate. They basically control all the smuggling between Colombia and Venezuela in most of the border between Colombia and Venezuela in Apure, Táchira, mostly Apure and Táchira states in Venezuela. And, uh, and, uh, and when we talk about smuggling, most of the time people think about food, but in the case of Venezuela, it's gasoline. And uh, that is a multi-million dollar business because of the humongous subsidies that Venezuela have on a gasoline price that then is being smuggled to Colombia in order to uh, resale that gasoline in Colombia at international prices, uh, which are the prices that they're using in Colombia. So, so uh, most of the gasoline that Colombians buy in border state and even some, in some places deep inside Colombia uh, is gasoline that is being smuggled from Venezuela, which is a big 
mistake, if you ask me, and Maduro announced last year, in August last year, in his last speech, uh, when he announced the economic measures, the latest economic measures, he announced uh, an increase of gasoline prices, which most Venezuelans believe, chavistas or not chavistas, believe that is extremely necessary uh, for different reasons. But one of the most important reasons is to stop this uh, uh, um, drainage of, of gasoline from Venezuela to Colombia. So these guys uh, control this business, uh, this criminal operation, I mean, and, and that criminal operation in Colombia, when you talk about gasoline, you talk about uh, one of the most important uh, raw materials that you use for processing drugs. So this is not a, only a, a criminal organization connected to smuggling, but it is also a criminal organization connected to uh, drug trafficking. So that's why uh, it has been created a lot of friction um, in Colombia. But also, it's I mean, it is important to highlight that that scandal that has been created in Colombia in relation to those photos is somehow connected to the what seems to be uh, that uh, the one that controls Colombia in reality right now, and most of people think that it is uh, Alvaro Uribe instead of Ivan Duque, the current president of Colombia. Um, most of the public opinion in Colombia believe that he is the one Alvaro Uribe, that control most of these paramilitary groups. And a lot of people believe that Alvaro Uribe gave the order to the Rastrojos to escort Guaidó in February um, this year with this crazy humanitarian aid operation coming from Chicuta that was a complete disaster. Uh, but uh, they... Uh, the, the, the crisis in Colombia, the public opinion crisis, is connected to that. I mean, uh, to, the, to, to deciding who is the president, but also to deciding who runs Colombia. I mean, how you, as the president of Colombia, directly or indirectly, uh, decided that the ones that have to uh, escort Guaidó coming for this, uh, media event in Cúcuta uh, was going to be a paramilitary organization instead of your own armed forces or security, you know, apparatus. So uh, in that sense, that's a crisis or the scandal in Colombia. But uh, it's important to highlight that from the Venezuelan side, in March this year, we put behind bars Wilfredo Torres Gomez, which is the head of the organization. So the, the two guys that you see in those photos with Guaidó are uh, the, the, the second and third uh, leaders of that criminal organization. But the head of the organization was put behind bars in Venezuela on March, almost uh, by like the 25th or the 28th of March this year. And that happened because of the arrest of Guaidó's chief of, chief of staff uh, which, wa which is Robert Marrero. Robert Marrero uh, uh, is the one that gives Venezuelan, after Venezuelan authorities arrest him, uh, he gave details in order to uh, facilitate the capture of this Wilfredo Torres Gómez. So from the Venezuelan side, uh, there is this evident connection between this criminal organizations and these political guys. And uh, that's what uh, the Venezuelan government has been trying to highlight in recent days. And there has been a lot of statements about how bad that is and that, the, that we are going to do something with the you know, uh, general attorney's office. Uh, but there are, there's always a lot of statements and, uh, and again, uh, not too much action from the Venezuelan government against Guaidó. Using justice, I'm not saying that we have to break the law. I mean, 
Uh, we have to follow the rule of law, but this guy is more than evident that he's part of a criminal organization or is very connected to a criminal organization and has break dozens of laws in Venezuela. So um, those are the things that I, I wanted to highlight uh, about this case. And to end, I want to say that uh, for me, uh, Bolivia is one of the things that worry me the most in recent days. For the last two days, they have, uh, I mean, there has been a lot of protests, violent protests in Bolivia against Evo Morales, and we are a few weeks before the presidential elections in, in, in Bolivia, and that's not uh, casual. I mean, that's not a, I mean, th th those things are planned, and that kind of violent protests are very similar to the Guarimbas uh, that happened in Venezuela. Uh, in 2014 and 2017, but also very similar to what happened in Nicaragua and what is happening right now in Hong Kong. So, uh, so we, I believe that we have to put a lot of attention, especially the ones that are connected to media, to spreading messages about the importance of supporting uh, President Evo Morales in uh, showing the violence that this criminal organization supported by the U.S. has been uh, uh, provoking in Bolivia uh, for the last 72 hours. So we need to try to uh, find videos, edit them, and, uh, and spread them all over the Internet in order to uh, not wait until the crisis is like at uh, uncontrollable levels uh, in order to act. I believe that you have to neutralize this kind of uh, event at the very beginning in order to to cut them from the root instead of waiting as has been the tradition most of the time because, you know, public opinion and blah, 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 and this and that. Uh, 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 and you also have these uh, liberals that that says that whatever that protest uh, is uh, a subject of uh, of all considerations, and 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 the truth is that in recent years the U.S. imperial apparatus has been using that strategy in order to promote regime change operation all over the world, and that I mean anyone that have a little bit of brain can understand that and can see that. And that has happened in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Hong Kong is happening right now. And if you ask me, I believe the Chinese government has been very uh, lenient uh, towards this uh, uh, rioters in, in Hong Kong. But also from the other side, in the analysis of, the, of this kind of crisis, uh, uh, you have the, the extremist Marxist Sometimes the trust case that says that whatever that protest also needs to be like, it's like a sacred thing that no one touches and represents the interests of the proletariat and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And the truth is when you analyze history, you don't have to go back in history more than 10 years to realize that these things are most of the time paid by the U.S. or the U.K. So I believe uh, I wanted to highlight that situation in connection to Bolivia uh, and Evo Morales, and I just want to ask everyone that uh, hear this message to act fast and assume the responsibility of defending Bolivia and defending Evo Morales and all the achievements that that guy has been uh, made in recent years to uh, take that country out of the deep hole, deep hole that neoliberalism uh, put it in for decades. So that's very important for me. And just to finish, I want to mention the case of, of course, Colombia and Guyana. And, uh, and this latest, uh, especially Colombia, I'm talking about Colombia and Guyana because those are the two uh, countries that might be used by the U.S. 
in order to provoke some sort of military confrontation with Venezuela. So it's like, like, like a proxy war or something like that. So, uh, but most importantly in Colombia, uh, and, and President Maduro was uh, act very fast, if you ask me, it's my opinion at least, uh, uh, denouncing uh, this kind of operations coming from Colombia. They basically, uh, a few days ago, by the last weekend, they start uh, connecting uh, the decision of uh, Ivan Marquez and Jesus Santrich and, and another big group of members, uh, former members of FARC, uh, they were trying to connect that, the, their decision of uh, going back to the armed struggle uh, to Venezuela. And they start uh, fabricating, using their media apparatus, some proofs uh, connecting Maduro with uh, protecting uh, guerrilla organizations that operate in Colombia but are protected in Venezuelan side, which is a big lie, and everyone knows that. I mean, Colombia state, the Colombian government, uh, I mean, Venezuela do not need to, to, to do that because the Colombian state is a failed state. And, and, and the guerrilla controls a lot of areas within Colombia. Guerrillas and paramilitary groups control a lot, a lot of areas within Colombia, and, and they don't need, they don't even need to, to, to cross the border to, uh, to get some sort of refugee because of the efficiency of the Colombian government. So in that sense, uh, I, w I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, I believe that the Venezuelan government uh, uh, act very fast in, in, in neutralizing and addressing this kind of operations, and that's why President Maduro announced a, 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 an orange alert, uh, which basically is like uh, he launched, uh, he moved uh, uh, an important contingent of, of, you know, Venezuelan troops and, and weapon systems to the border with Colombia in order to uh, in order to neutralize whatever uh, these crazy guys that uh, are uh, in the head of the Colombian government uh, might try to do against Venezuela. So I believe that that decision was very efficient from President Maduro. And uh, we need to keep an eye on that because uh, that's uh, one of the biggest threats that we are facing right now. This regarding the decision of you know getting rid of Trump's getting rid of Bolton and all the theories about what caused it or, or what uh, did not cause it, I don't want to you know waste too much energy in that. But the truth is that uh, that Venezuela is still threatened, and we cannot you know make a big party uh, thinking that because of Trump getting rid of Bolton, uh, uh, everything's going to be. Uh, uh, beautiful uh, from now on. And the contrary, I mean, things might get uh, worse. So we have to be prepared of that. And I believe that that uh, my impression is that, uh, that the Venezuelan government is, paying, is acting accordingly. So that's it, my friend. Thank you again. Just to end, I want to tell you that uh, in a few weeks, uh, on November 28th, we are going to uh, reach our first anniversary. So we are trying to work uh, in improving our website. And of course, we're going to try to launch in a few weeks uh, fundraising, which is very important for us because we don't receive any sort of uh, funding from the government and from anyone besides donations that we receive from time to time that are very scarce, especially for in the last three or four months. So we're going to work this next few weeks trying to organize this fundraising, and we encourage you to help us with that, with ideas or anything, because we really need it. And the website is doing great in terms of traffic and in terms of ranking, so we are very happy. And I believe that soon we're going to be uh, side by side in terms of rankings with important websites like Venezuela Analysis or even the Gray Zone, which I believe is one of the best websites uh, uh, right now about Venezuela and, and other uh, global issues. So I hope 
I, and, and we uh, yeah, need your help with that. Thank you a lot for listening to us, and I hope to see you next week.